and good morning to all the participants. Assalamu alaikum. The Department of Law and Human Rights, University of Asia Pacific, the Bangladesh Legal Aid and Services Trust Plus, and UNESCO Madanjit Singh, South Asian Institute of Advanced Legal and Human Rights Studies, UMSales, are pleased to welcome you to the International Virtual Conference on the occasion of the 50 Years of Bangladesh, Comparative Constitutionalism, Human Rights, and Gender Equality. The conference will take place for two days, and I, Pan Mohamed Araf, lecturer of UAP, welcomes you to the first session of the conference titled, Developments of Constitutional Institutions, Constitutional Perspectives. The aim of this conference is to provide a forum for early career scholars and PhD students of law, history, anthropology, human rights, and other relevant disciplines from Bangladesh and abroad to present their original research and exchange ideas with the senior panelists and other participants who will be attending the conference. I will now be introducing our respected participants for today's panel discussions. Joined with us here in the virtual conference today, we have the first discussant, Barrister Mustafizur Rahman Khan. He is an advocate of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. He routinely appears in judicial review applications, reads for important constitutional matters, and advises banks and corporations. He's also engaged in domestic and international arbitrations under the auspices of the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, and the International Center for Settlement of Investment Dispute, ICSID. He will be discussing his views with us during the sessions. Next discussion to enlighten us on the topics of development of constitutional institutions is Dr. Cynthia Farid. Dr. Cynthia Farid is a Bangladeshi lawyer with experience in research, law reform, and a range of rule of law programming with INGOs, think tanks, and legal rights organizations. Having completed her bar from the United Kingdom and Bangladesh, she graduated with advanced degrees from Cornell Law School and the University of Wisconsin Law School. Her research interests include social legal history, constitutional and administrative law, and law and development. She has published internationally and is the organizer of two international research collaboratives of the Law and Society Association, USA, on South Asian legal systems and praxis in the global South that have brought together scholars from around the globe. Now I will introduce the presenters who will present their research papers to the participants and attendees of the conference. First, I'd like to introduce Mr. Peter Reed and Ms. Gayanti Ranatunga, who will present a paper on parliamentarism in Bangladesh, Lessons for Sri Lanka. Peter Reed has joined us from Scotland today. He's a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. His thesis examines the change from a Westminster system to one with an executive president in Sri Lanka, Guyana, and the Gambia, and the layered constitutions that emerge as a result. Peter also holds a master's by research from the University of Edinburgh, in which he compared the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament to the Speaker of the House of Commons. Peter is broadly interested in comparative constitutional law. Peter is also co-author of Parliament, Law, History and Practice, which was published by Center for Policy Alternatives in 2019. The paper was jointly presented by Gayanti Ranatunga, who is an early career researcher with the Center for Policy Alternatives in Colombo, Sri Lanka. She has an initial BA and Master of Arts in English Language and Literature from Wichita State University, Kansas, USA. She also has an MPhil in Race, Ethnicity and Conflict from the Trinity College of Dublin, Ireland, and an LLM in International Law and International Relations from the University of Bristol in the UK. Her research interests include religious orientations in post-conflict settings, such as, but not limited to, Sri Lanka, Somaliland, Buddhist extremism, Islamic jurisprudence, and African human rights. 
he remains an avid reader who enjoys Russian writers past and present. Welcome to the session. And then we also have another paper presentation with will be taking place in this conference. And the presenter is Dr. Norman Riyad, who will be presenting on judicial independence in Bangladesh and Pakistan comparisons. Dr. Norman Riyad is a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Law and Politics, Cardiff University. His project involves publication of a monograph and two papers on judicial independence in authoritarian and hybrid regimes. He completed his PhD on judicial independence in authoritarian and hybrid regimes at the Department of Politics, University of New York in 2020. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome the moderator of today's conference session, who will be taking over the panel discussions from me, Dr. Chaudhuri Shakamad Siddiqui. Dr. Siddiqui is the head of Department of Law and Human Rights at the University of Asia Pacific, and also the deputy director of sales. He's also a practitioner of the Appellate Division of Supreme Court of Bangladesh and regularly appears before the court in important constitutional matters. He's also a specialist on energy law in Bangladesh with a doctorate from the University of Dundee. Dr. Siddiqui publishes his research work regularly in national and international journals and textbooks. Ishak sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning uh, to wherever you have joined us from all over around the world. Uh, I really want to thank the presenters for uh, getting up so early to take part in this conference. I really appreciate the effort. I also want to thank our discussants for uh, taking the time to uh, come over here and give their valuable feedback on the papers that we presented in today's conference. So without further ado, I would kindly request uh, Mr. Peter Reed and Ms. Gayantika to present their papers. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly well, thank you. Perfect, all right. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity to present. In our paper, Parliamentarism in Bangladesh, Lessons for Sri Lanka, we examined Bangladesh's constitutional experience and provisions, drawing on comparative methodologies to predict how such provisions may fare in Sri Lanka in a transition to parliamentarism. Historical, cultural, and political similarities between the two countries make a comparison between them quite useful with an eye towards predicting. Our selection is based on the most similar cases principle. Case studies that control the variables as far as possible. By being as similar as possible in everything other than the factor we are researching, then that is the causal factor in any diverging outcomes. Our methodology isolates structural features of parliamentarism as causal factors on constitutional performance in the context of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and forecast how these designs may affect politics and in Sri Lanka based on how they fared in Bangladesh. Our comparison controls for constitutional history, socio-political practice and military influence in both countries. Sri Lanka and Bangladesh both began at independence with the Westminster system, which has created an enduring legacy of domestic expectations of constitutionalism. Sri Lanka and Bangladesh also have a history of personalized patronage oriented dynastic rule. Although the military's role is not identical in both countries, we consider it to be similar enough to merit this uh, comparison. Sri Lanka has never had a successful military coup unlike Bangladesh, but um, the current president's use of military symbolism, appointment of military officials to civilian positions, and the use of the military to provide civilian services, especially in these times of COVID, make it more similar to Bangladesh than many other countries. Varying political tactics exist in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. In the latter, parliament boycotts and hartels feature prominently, which are not a component of the Sri Lankan political landscape. With other variables constant, boycotts and hartels have negatively influenced parliamentary efficacy in Bangladesh, leading us to argue that a transition to parliamentarism in Sri Lanka will be more operational as such boycotts are not a feature there in, in, in Sri Lanka. 
So what this paper fails to control for is the nature of the political divisions in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. No parallel exists in Sri Lanka for the Avami League BNP acrimony where politics are animated considerably by ethnic divisions and anxieties rather than a rigid party line, unlike in Bangladesh. Uh, like in Bangladesh, rather. Compared to Sri Lanka, Bangladesh's politics are relatively unmarred by historical ethno-religious tensions. Bangladesh's relative homogeneity and uniform Bengali identity accounts in large part to this. In Sri Lanka, which is a far more diverse population, historical rifts and jaw along ethnic and religious demarcations, all of which culminated in a near 30 year civil war, which ended in 2009. And now Peter will continue with further details. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Ganthi. <clears throat> for that uh, explanation of our of our case selection, um, I, I hope that everyone will forgive uh, my my voice, which is a little bit hoarse today. Um, but uh, ho hopefully, if I if I just speak a, a little bit slowly, um, everyone will will um, will hear me clearly enough. Anyway, um, so so I'd like to give a little bit of background on um, on Sri Lanka's constitutional history and and our interest in this project. So the, the roots of the Sri Lankan parliament lie in 1833, when the colonial proto-legislature was first established. Um, although the then legislative council's powers were very limited, this was always intended as the first move towards full self-government in the future. And uh, changes in the council's membership and powers eventually um, resulted in the state council of 1931, um, almost, almost 100 years later under the Donomir constitution. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Dunbar Constitution. Um, this was an executive legislative body comprising multiple committees. And uh, finally, Sri Lanka's independence constitution, the Sulbury Constitution, was passed in 1948. And uh, un under, under this independence constitution, the parliament consisted of two chambers, which were the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, operating under a Westminster model constitution. Sri Lanka became a republic in 1972, and the new constitution actually um, removed um, many of the safeguards which the which the Sobri structure had installed, and and uh, the the cornerstone of the of the first republican constitution was um, was parliamentary sovereignty, um, and it also established a unicameral legislature known as the National State Assembly. This was then replaced um, with the current constitution in 1978. So the, the 78 constitution um, consciously incorporated many aspects of the Fifth French Republic into Sri Lanka's institutions. Uh, most significantly, Sri Lanka changed from parliamentary system into a semi-presidential semi -presidential one. So this means that uh, um, there was a directly elected president and executive power was split between the legislature and the president. In 2015, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution enhanced parliamentary control over the legis uh, um, parliamentary control over the cabinet, I should say. Um, however, the chain the system changed back again under the recent 20th Amendment. So, so there are um, there are strong arguments for for a return to parliamentarism in Sri Lanka. Um, a democratization campaign in 2014, 2015 was one of the most significant political processes in the country's history. Um, uh, uh, under this movement, politicians from, from polar ends of the um, divide came together in calls for Yaha Palanaya or good governance. And uh, reformers were elected on a mandate to abolish the executive presidency. Um, uh, and the reformers won both the presidency and, uh, and a parliamentary majority. Now, as I mentioned, the resulting 19th Amendment only weakened the presidency and uh, restored some of the parliament's executive control. However, the campaign process crystallised some context-specific interactions between Sri Lankan society, um, politics and constitutional design. So there's a deep compatibility between um, Sri Lankan democratic, republican values and parliamentarism on the one hand, and a more hier hierarchical um, ethnocracy and presidentialism, on the other hand. 
um, so so perhaps far from from representing the values of of you know the the, the French Republic or, or America's founding fathers, a monarchical symbolism has been used to synergize Sri Lankan presidentialism with an alternative to constitutional democracy. And I should clarify that this this wasn't a program to remove the electoral character of the state. However, um, it, ha it has been hostile to minority rights and scrutiny of, of the ruling elite. Um, parliamentarism is sort of seen as a way to de-reify the head of government and increase uh, scrutiny of the executive. <clears throat> so I'll now discuss some uh, specific experiences in Bangladesh that are important for Sri Lankan constitutional design. Um, in this paper, we've discussed five areas, which are the head of state, political accountability, floor crossing, parliamentary committees, and Bangladesh's technocrat ministers. So um, in this paper, we, we actually give a lot, of, a lot of space to the design of the head of state in, in a future par um, parliamentary um, system in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, this, this, mean, this may seem a little bit surprising at first, considering the ceremonial role of a president under, under parliamentarism. However, the reason that we do this is that the corrective role that even a ceremonial pre president might have is often overlooked in the literature. Um, presidents in parliamentary systems tend to be seen as just, just the puppet of the prime minister carrying out their, their role vicariously. Um, however, we think that this, this, um, this should not be the case in all of the president's functions um, in, in a Sri Lankan parliamentary system. So that's why in, in this paper, we actually use the term presidential corrective rather than ceremonial president um, to describe, to describe our, our, our proposals based on the Bangladesh experience. Um, so the, the broad lesson that we think Sri Lanka ought to take from Bangladesh um, is that while the powers of the president ought to be limited, he should not be constitutionally deprived of all of his discretion. And also an indirectly elected president ought to command the support of a base that goes beyond simply the governing party. So this term, parliamentary systems with presidential corrective, it builds on studies of previous European systems, which were often seen as um, semi-presidential, but with particularly weak presidents. Um, so examples of this include the, the two earliest European instances of semi-presidentialism, which were Finland and the, and the Weimar Republic. We would propose that um, powers such as the right to return a bill for reconsideration or to ask the Prime Minister to reconsider advice to the President, or to question that advice, are appropriate powers for, um, for a President in Sri Lanka. In Bangladesh, where the President acts almost, almost exclusively on the advice of the Prime Minister, there have been calls for the President to have more, of, um, more formal power or discretion in this area. There is a, nonetheless, there is a, there is a precedent in, 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 um, in Bangladesh for the president returning a bill for reconsideration against the, against the wishes of the prime minister. Um, although this wasn't necessarily envisaged under, under the constitution. Um, so there are, also, there are also presidential powers in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, which would be better exercised by other authorities the President of Bangladesh exercises important powers, including the power to appoint the Attorney General, senior judges and commission members. Subject to, subject to, to some restrictions, the President may also prorogue and dissolve Parliament. In all the functions, apart from the appointment of the Prime Minister and the Chief Justice, the President must act on the advice of the Prime Minister. Therefore, the Prime Minister exercises by proxy some of the most important state powers um, which, which modern constitutions would normally entrust to impartial authorities. Uh, particularly successive governments have used the president's powers to, to politicize civil service appointments in Bangladesh. Um, and this is also an issue in Sri Lanka. It's an issue which actually the, the previous 19th Amendment framework went quite a long way um, towards, towards remedying. Um, 
So we, so we argue that these are powers which modern constitutions ought to trust to, to impartial commissions rather than cabinet through a figurehead president. Um, Bangladesh demonstrates that the, the corrective president ought to have a cross-party support rather than only the support of the, the governing party. The president of Bangladesh is indirectly, indirectly elected uh, by the parliament. Calls for reform have often included the need to diversify this appointment process, particularly to include local governments and a mandatory level of opposition support. Now, it should be noted that um, although the president's appointment does, does relatively little to separate the off-soldier from the cabinet in Bangladesh, for the, for the president's removal, a uh, two-thirds majority is required in the um, Jataya Sangsat. In the case of Sri Lanka, it's especially impo important for the president um, to function with the trust of religious and ethnic minorities, um, as well as whichever party is in power. In, in, in this paper, we, we, we also see Bangladesh as, as something of a warning against presidential ordinances. So uh, MPs, including government backbenchers, have, have been irritated sometimes by government's proclivity to, to introduce laws as ordinances in Bangladesh and then expect parliament to pass a corresponding act. Uh, worse still, these ordinances are sometimes flagship laws and when turning them into ordinary legislation, the, the proper procedures aren't always followed. Um, so so I'll, 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 I'll turn now to, to our, our, our second point of comparison, um, which, is, um, which is political accountability under parliamentary system. Bangladesh has introduced um, accountability mechanisms which would export well to Sri Lanka. Um, because Sri Lanka does not suffer from boycott politics, these mechanisms could even have more success um, than, than, than they have in, in Bangladesh. So, so in Bangladesh, the, the Prime Minister and Cabinet are now more accessible to, to MPs, um, allowing for more effective scrutiny and um, institutionally engaged politics. Even in a centralised and, and um, quite authoritarian political climate, backbenchers and opposition MPs have been able to exercise some influence over legislation. Um, furthermore, in, in early parliaments after, after democratisation, the Speaker was quite diplomatic in accommodating unscheduled debates um, tabled by the opposition, which encouraged parliamentary rather than, rather than protest politics. So we, we, we found that uh, a weakness in, in accountability identified by Bangladesh commentators is the government's tendency to, to announce important policy decisions away from the dispatch box and uh, deliberately avoid engagement with, with MPs. Um, such conduct really goes against the grain of, of parliamentary democracy. And, and we found that there's maybe, there's maybe um, a good argument for codifying rules around policy announcements to be made within the parliament um, to actually codify these within the constitution. Now, the, the absence of boycott politics in Sri Lanka means that parliamentarism would function more effectively, we think, than, than, than in Bangladesh. Um, when a parliament operates under Westminster procedures, in, in particular Westminster model procedures, the key role and power of the opposition is to scrutinise the government policy and practice. Um, this means that they need the right to be heard, the right to call on ministers to answer questions, and um, good resources as well to keep them informed. Um, but, but if the opposition isn't present, and of course um, the, the government can effectively run the country without, without political scrutiny. Um, boycotts have not been institutionalised in Sri Lanka as they have been in Bangladesh. Um, so so um, the, the closest which Sri Lanka has really come to boycott politics perhaps, um, is perhaps um, some Tamil political movements. But even the Tamil population is not monolithic and voting patterns can't easily be directed by the leaders. Um, our, our third point of comparison, I, re I realise I'm, I'm running a little bit short on time here, but um, I'll, 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 quickly, I'll quickly come to the end. Um, our, our third point of comparison was, was, floor, sorry, was floor crossing. Um, I found that in, in both countries, in both Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, um, 
party leaders exercise quite severe control over over MPs' independence, um, and then that this this is enshrined in the constitution. Um, and, and we realise that there, in neither country are there easy answers to to this. I mean, of course, the um, well, there's well, there's always value in in, the, in having independence for MPs. We, we we also need to ensure that systems are are stable enough to, to function properly. Um, so 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 I I, th I think that um, when we when we looked at this issue, um, we found that perhaps the the best thing that can be done is just a cross fertilisation of debate, um, which which could be taking place um, between both countries which have fairly similar rules. Um, in, in Sri Lanka, um, M MPs can lose their seat um, if, if they're expelled from their party, whereas in Bangladesh. MPs can lose seat after after voting against their party. Um, so 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 I'll now turn to, to Bangladesh's committee system. A well structured committee system is, is of course an effect, um, an effective tool to allow bipartisan discussion um, of legislative detail and also encourage opposition and backbench influence over government legislation. They allow governments to um, pass legislation in need while also opening the door. Um, to, to opposition expertise, which other parliamentary proceedings are, aren't normally conducive to. Um, so Bangladesh's fifth and seventh parliaments um, made, made significant efforts to enhance the role of committees. And although, although the overall picture is not, isn't necessarily a positive one, uh, there have been tangible successes that offer, that offer hope for the future. Uh, particularly committees have at times allowed for more cross-party cooperation than is possible elsewhere. And also the government has been willing to accept amendments um, proposed in committee. And these, these, these are sometimes significant changes to the bill. Um, so so our, our, our final um, you know, le lesson, lesson as it was, uh, you know, from, from, this, from this comparative study was, um, was uh, par Parliament's innovation in, in technocrat, um, sorry, Bangladesh's innovation in technocrat ministers. Her unelected members of cabinet appointed under Article 56.2. Mm -hmm. um, technocrat ministers are limited to, to a tenth of the overall cabinet membership. Um, and under, under Article 73A1, these ministers may take part in proceedings, including votes insofar as they relate to their respective ministries. So, so that this this is an innovation which is uncommon. It's, it's not unheard of, but it's quite uncommon in, in, in you know Westminster model democracies. Um, and the, the, the Sri Lankan system does allow for a number of um, appointed uh, MPs. Um, ha, however, this, this doesn't seem to have been used to, to, to bring in expertise, to bring in you know, te technocratic expertise. Um, so, so we found in other studies that um, technocratic appointments globally don't normally, or, or they don't necessarily rec um, remedy the, the key complaint they're designed to address, which is a lack of expertise in the legislature. We found that, uh, that governments um, tend to favour experts with real world knowledge and political experience. Um, they, they, they found that they, they, these experts tend to have their, their most trust when bringing them into, into the cabinet, they tend to function the best. Um, so, so they also look for experts with political canny. Nonetheless, in Sri Lanka, um, it might be a good idea to include um, in the cons to include in the constitution some goods that technocrat ministers are designed to achieve. So, so ex explicitly mentioning that they're that they're there to bring expertise into parliament um, and perhaps also diversity. Um, we 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 also feel that um, as in Bangladesh, there ought to be a cap on their on their proportion within the cabinet. Um, the, the the one tenth proportion seems seems fair. Um, and 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 we also added that the you know, the the great offices of state as 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 they were known, um, so chancellor, foreign secretary, home secretary, ought to be drawn from elected cabinet members. Um, we we think that this 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 could this could better this could better ensure that uh, these these ministers balance the influence of the prime minister and cabinet. Um, so, so I think I'm slightly over there. I'll, I'll just very quickly wrap up. Um, th th those, those are, you know, they, they sort of. That's the background to to this study and the the um, the key lessons 
that we thought we could we could draw on um, from the Bangladesh experience and in, in, in trying to in trying to envisage constitu future constitutional change in, in Sri Lanka. Um, th th thanks very much for 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 listening to to our presentation there, um, and and I'll I'll pass it back now if that's all right. Thank you, Peter and Galantika, for your presentation. I thought it was a very enlightening piece on uh, the comparisons between Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, the institutional developments in regard to the constitutional making of the parliaments of both these two countries. Uh, now I kindly request uh, Dr. Norman Riyadh uh, to present his paper. Dr. Riyadh. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, comparison of uh, the uh, higher judiciary in Bangladesh and Pakistan on this very uh, occasion, the completion of 50 years of Bangladesh constitution. So today I'm going to compare the nature and scope of judicial independence in Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, but before presenting my main argument, let me explain uh, what do I mean by judicial independence. Uh, I mean the increase or decrease in both de jure and de facto judicial independence. And these two components are not static. Uh, a certain degree of judicial independence exists in, exists in almost every country. And hence treating judicial independence as if it, is, it has a static nature does not explain anything. It is dynamic and either decreases or decreases. The increase in de jure judicial independence by, by that I mean the increase in guarantees available to the judiciary in a constitution or a legal document um, against undue influence by other branches of the state. Uh, the increase in de facto judicial independence means the increase in judicial power, which is visible in the successful protection of the court against any court packing or court curbing actions by other branches of the state decisions made by the court against the political interests of other branches of the state and the implementation of those decisions. By court packing, uh, I mean the, uh, no, the other part, uh, the removal of a judge or appointment of a judge who is expected to behave in favor of the executive or the appointing authority. Court curbing actions of regime means restrictions on the powers of the court by the executive or parliament. Now, why his his a question arises? Why I'm not looking into the impartiality aspect? And this is the question most of the time I receive. That uh, you know, what if a judge is a political actor, and if he is behaving in accordance with the political consideration or in context, and if he is not behaving in accordance with the law? Now, my answer to that is, impartiality is a myth. You know, it's it's almost impossible. Judges are humans. They but have, Ariad, could you please kindly speak a bit slowly so that it's easier for everyone to uh, understand? Just a bit slowly. Thank I you. Yeah. So, uh, so the impartiality aspect is a myth uh, in context of uh, you know South Asia, where judges, like all other humans, they are human. You know, they they have called emotions. They uh, you know they receive different information and they process that thing, and they cannot detach themselves. From the context, and especially in a South Asian environment, which is a caste-based, tribal, you know, full of tribal affiliations and family connections, so that is almost impossible to expect them to to behave in accordance with the law. So, in short, they are not robots, and that's why I didn't look into the impartiality. And another reason for not looking into the impartiality aspect of judicial independence is that, you know, it's the decisions of the higher judiciaries, they create losers or winners. So both of them have got reasons, good reasons to accuse judges of being political. Uh, and if it is the political involvement, then you know, in, there are a number of cases in the UK and the US context that can easily prove that judges are political actors and hence they are not you know, impartial. Uh, so that's why I didn't look into the impartiality context. Now, of course, in this paper refers to the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and the Supreme Court of Pakistan. I compare these two courts and does not, you know, do not compare uh, other tiers of the legal system because all decisions of the lower court ultimately reach the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And hence that variable of the implementation of the decisions 
uh, we cannot examine unless it's you know it will, it will accept on you know people will keep on challenging those decisions and it will not attain finality until it reaches the higher judiciaries now a significant degree of de jure de jure judicial independence existed in both pakistan and bangladesh since their independences in 1947 and 1971 respectively there were three constitutions in pakistan 1956 constitution 1962 constitution 1973 constitution and one constitution was enacted in bangladesh in 1972 now the preamble of all these constitution you know they uh, in Bangladesh and Pakistan formally provides that the independence of the judiciary shall be fully ensured. These constitutions of these two countries protected the process of judicial appointments. And you know, until 2005, Pakistan case was similar to Bangladesh regarding the process of judicial appointment that it, judges of the Supreme Court shall and the High Court shall be appointed by the president um, after, the consultation, after consultation with the Chief Justice. The process of removal of the judges, uh, powers and jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and provincial high courts in case of Pakistan, and the perks and privileges of the superior judges. So these were all these constitution provide uh, some kind of uh, you know formal independence. Now the wider literature on comparative constitutional law and politics give explanation for judicialization of politics, constitutional politics, and constitutionalism. But very few studies, you know, specifically focus on the concept of judicial independence in authoritarian and hybrid regime like those in uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan since 1947 and 1971, respectively. These studies attribute judicial independence to constitutional designs, like constitutional provisions, and you know, the main lesson is is because the constitution provisions empower the judges, and that's why they behave, you know, in, in a certain way. Uh, legal history legal culture or political competition, the strategic framework. Almost none provides an interdisciplinary account of uh, judicial independence. Uh, but you know, this is what this is my attempt to provide to fill the gap for, for, by providing such an account. And you know, by doing so, I I'm kind of suggesting that constitutions are important in terms of providing a broad framework and boundaries between institutions. But a combination of social, political, and legal factors, you know, that are equally important and that we need to look into. Uh, had it been the constitution, constitution is there in 19 since 1972 in the case of Bangladesh. In Pakistan, it is the last constitution is there in, since 1973. But we can see the increase in judicial power, you know, over a time at specific junctures, which are shaped by these different legal, political, and social factors, which I'm going to explain now. Now, my main argument is that judicial independence increased and maintained itself after 2005 in Pakistan and did not emerge in Bangladesh because of three factors. The first factor is socioeconomic changes, which gave rise to the middle class and media in both Bangladesh and Pakistan almost at the same time and created an opportunity for the judiciary to engage with the middle class and media and cultivate their support through independent behavior against the political interest of the ruling regime. Now, starting you know, explaining this factor in case of Pakistan, the military regime of General Pervez Musharraf back in, uh, you know, from, in, in, uh, uh, from 1999 to till 2008, uh, massively privatized, you know, sectors including banking sectors, telecommunications, and privatization created jobs and small-scale business opportunities, resulting in a huge uh, portion of the population joining the middle class. This class consisted mainly of those who were available, who were, who were able to provide paid, skilled services. They were upwardly mobile, educated, and salaried people including professionals, teachers, lawyers, and students. Uh, and you know, as, a as a result, Pakistan was ranked in the top 10 countries of the world by the size of its middle class. However, with the rise of the middle class, the demand for more jobs, good services, more access to the state, and a, a rule-based system increased. Now, on the other side, the means of mass communication and opportunities to spread the message you know, by uh, institutions, individuals, 
were limited before 2000, uh, you know, the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, telecommunication was one of the sectors privatized during the military regime of General Parvez Musharraf. And as a re result of that privatization, the access to information increased. Before 2000, there was one state-owned television channel in Pakistan, and it was not bro broadcasting 24 hours a day or the live transmission. Uh, similarly, before you know 2000, there was one radio network uh, called Pakistan Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, after the privatiz privatization of these, this telecommunication sector in the early 2000s, hundreds of private channels with the ability to broadcast 24 hours a day were launched. Now, this factor created an opportunity for the judiciary to cultivate the support of the middle class and media by protecting their rights, uh, especially when the demand for, you know, when the dis dissatisfaction of the middle class with the uh, ruling regime was all time high uh, in case of Pakistan. So the middle class and media can contribute to successful protection of the judiciary through anti-regime and pro-judiciary demonstrations or anti-regime litigation, which encourages the, the judiciary to behave independently. And I will explain this later when I will talk about the factor of judicial uh, leadership. Uh, in Bangladesh, socioeconomic changes such as the rise of the middle class and media took place around the same time and at a similar rate as in Pakistan. The economy of Bangladesh has grown over 6% annually in the last decade. Its status has changed from low income to lower middle income. As of 2019, per capita income was $1,500. Uh, as of 2021, the total population is estimated, the, uh, estimated to be 160 million, 25% of which falls in the middle class. However, unlike, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, unlike Pakistan, uh, the different surveys and the different uh, public opinion service reports, uh, such as the International Republican Institute uh, in 2015, showed that 67% of population supported the government and the incumbent regime uh, of uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And, you know, after this victory in 2014, the support uh, maintained and it kept on increasing. Now, the, similar to Pakistan, media in Bangladesh was monopolized by uh, Bangladesh television until the late 1990s, which was similar to the situation in Pakistan. Like the Pakistan Broadcasting Corporation, Bangladesh Betar had a monopoly over uh, radio broadcasting. Uh, the privatization of electronic media began with the establishment of channels such as ATN Bangla in 1997, Channel I in 1999, and Ukrishet Television in 2000. As of 2020, there are 45 private televisions, uh, 28 radio channels, and you know uh, over 1,000 daily newspapers in Bangladesh. And the viewership also is, is you know kept on increasing. Now, the this this fact, unlike the media in Pakistan, the rise of the media was not followed by increasing engagement between the media and uh, you know the uh, and media and the supreme court of bangladesh and i will explain later you know how this engagement increase and this engagement was visible in public interest litigation and the demonstration for the support of the higher judiciary in case of pakistan but not in case of bangladesh uh, unlike the supreme court of pakistan the supreme court of bangladesh did not rely upon media sources in public interest litigation massively the second factor is the divisions within elites. Now, the first factor I explained was the socioeconomic changes, the rise of the middle class and the media and the opportunity created for the judiciaries, higher judiciary in two countries to behave independently and cultivate the support of the media and the middle class. But the second factor is divisions within elites, which divides opposition to the judiciary, you know, the executive pressure and the parliament's pressure to devise uh, the opposition to the judiciary and creates an opportunity for the judiciary to behave independently of the ruling regime and cultivate its support. The support provided by the first and second factor can protect the judiciary against court curbing and court uh, packing actions of the ruling regime. But you know the the this third factor creates space in the sense that is uh, the judiciary. It signals to the higher judiciary 
that the pressure you know, the, um, of the executive cannot be exercised in a way in, in the same way in which uh, uh, an authoritarian regime or a strong uh, you know, regime with two third majority can, uh, can exert uh, on the judiciary. There's always some degree of uh, friction between opposition political parties and the ruling party in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Since 1947 and 1971 in two countries respectively, you can see this thing. And which created opportunities for the judiciary to use the conflict between political opponents and behave independently. However, the Supreme Court of Pakistan was able to use the, this opportunity to cultivate the support you know, only after 2005. Because the presence of a strategic and popular chief justice who was willing and able to do this. In contrast, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh could not use this opportunity consistently between opposing parties in their favor to gain autonomy from the executive uh, and, and, be, and behave independently. Uh, you know, when behave independently, especially before 2008, when governments in power were weak and did not have absolute majorities in parliament. The reason for the inability, inability of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh to take advantage of the opportunity was the lack of a strong and popular judicial leader in Bangladesh. Uh, you know, however, you know, Awami League secured a two-third majority in the general elections of 2008, 2014, 2018. Uh, and these regimes are strong and hence the Supreme Court of Bangladesh did not feel encouraged to behave independently of the government by making decisions against its interest. Now, this leads me to the third factor, which is equally important. And that is the emergence of a strategic and popular judicial leader. Now, there are existing studies on judicial leadership, judicial heroes, uh, and you know, recently the Cambridge uh, publications, publishers, they have published this multi-authored edited book on um, towering judges, which suggests that this, uh, you know, judges, uh, individual judges, sometimes make uh, make a difference, and they are a very important factor uh, in examining and analyzing the scope, nature, and scope of judicial independence. So, the emer when I say the emergence of strategic and popular judicial leadership, who is willing uh, and able to lead the judiciary to take advantage of the opportunities created by the first two factors, now the presence of such a judge can utilize all these opportunities created by the factors uh, you know, I explained before. By strategic judge, I mean who is aware of socio-political, socio-economic context and how to use that context in favor of the court against other branches of the state. By popular judge, I mean a judge supported by distinct groups or classes of society, either through anti-regime and pro-judiciary demonstrations, just like in Egypt, Pakistan, Poland, or anti-regime uh, litigation. Now, litigation is also a mechanism with, through which you signal to the judiciary that we trust you and you have got our support so that you know, they feel encouraged that, okay, fine, our, our implementation compliance will be there. Uh, you know, they can, these groups can support that compliance. Now, until 2005, the socioeconomic changes and division within elite factors were present in Pakistan, but the judicial leadership factor was absent in Pakistan. However, this factor uh, emerged in the shape of Justice Chaudhary, who was appointed as the Chief Justice of Pakistan on 30th June 2005. Uh, Justice Chaudhary was the most strategic judge in the judicial history of Pakistan because he was aware of the above, you know, the uh, opportunities I explained, the factors I explained, but chose not to avail himself of them until he became the Chief Justice. The behavior of the Justice Chaudhary changed after his appointment as the Chief Justice of Pakistan. Uh, uh, on the day of his appointment, he made a speech which clearly signaled that he was aware of those opportunities, he's aware of the middle class, vibrant civil society, and the media. And the speech reflected his intentions and plans to engage with the media and the middle class. So the uh, Justice Chaudhary increased engagement with the media and the uh, middle class. Uh, you know, through by by lowering down by increasing slow motor cases notices 
on all those issues which were predominantly appealing to the middle class and lowered the local standi of uh, you know the uh, of of petitioners under article 143 of the constitution which empowered the supreme court to uh, enforce the fundamental rights uh, rights and you know make decisions on uh, cases pertaining to public interest now initially the regime military regime tolerated this behavior but when the supreme court of pakistan under the leadership of the of justice choudhry harmed the core core interest of the regime uh, then the military regime of general musharraf retaliated by suspending justice choudhry the suspension triggered mass demonstrations by civil society organizations journalists lawyers students and opposition political parties and this this is the thing which which we which is missing in many other authoritarian and hybrid regimes present in uh, case of the judges club of the egypt uh, and you know the, in recent times in poland as well now the suspension of this justice choudhry signaled the judiciary executive conflict which motivated opposition political parties to support the restoration of justice choudhry uh, and create space for themselves by making general musharraf unpopular for his attack on the independence of the judiciary until this stage the supreme court of pakistan added the support of opposition political parties to uh, the supporting structure at the same time they challenged the suspension suspension of justice choudhry before the supreme court of pakistan directly challenged in the wake of demonstrations and petitions uh, the supreme court of pakistan restored uh, justice choudhry which indicated that there was an attempt of court packing but the court successfully protected its you know this uh, itself against the court packing action of the regime uh, and that to an authoritarian regime however general musharraf again sacked uh, justice choudhry this time along with other judges of the supreme court and provincial high court with the pro proclamation of emergency on 3rd of november 2007 but it took two long marches first in 2008 and then in 2009 long marches for the restoration of the judges removed on 3 november to restore all of these judges which again indicated that court packing actions the court protected itself against court packing actions of the authoritarian and hybrid regimes and that too through uh, a popular process demonstrations not through a constitutional change not through some kind of a you know series of verdicts and that indicates the increase in de facto uh, independence of uh, the supreme court of pakistan after the restoration we can see the petitions you know direct petitions before the supreme court of pakistan after the restoration in 2009 not soon after the uh, enactment of constitution in 1973 the petition increased from 0 in 2008 to 6784 in 2010 and then 16217 in 2012 which suggests that the trust in the supreme court of pakistan increased massively and it was signaling to the encouraging the judges to behave independent on the other hand may i just kind of request you to wrap it up uh, in the next couple of minutes Thank yeah, you. It's, it's more, you know, last few lines. On the other hand, the regime leadership factor was missing in Bangladesh. All to, all, you know, different chief justices of Bangladesh had delivered bold decisions against the political interest of the executive. For example, in uh, Salim Ullah versus Bangladesh, former uh, chief justice of Bangladesh, Khairul Haq declared the care like a government and constitutional. Um, but you know. none uh, you know none of the chief justices of the supreme court of bangladesh let alone individual judges take any significant actions to engage with the middle class and the media to cultivate their support and they could not mobilize heterogeneous societal groups against the regime and my findings all of the above three factors are equally essential for the increase in judicial independence in authoritarian and hybrid regimes like those in bangladesh and pakistan strong and popular judicial leadership is unable to, to do anything without finding an opportunity to strengthen the judiciary against other branches of the state similarly the availability of opportunities to cultivate supporting structures will not mean anything if the chief justice leading the higher judiciary is not willing 
and able to take advantage of the available opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rea. That was very uh, interesting observation in regard to uh, the Supreme Court of Pakistan and the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. I think uh, we'll get a lot of questions on that. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please uh, type it in directly to me or Mr. Saleh Akram, and we would be asking those questions after the panelists give their feedback. And in that vein, I'd kindly request Dr. Cynthia Farid uh, to uh, kindly give her feedback on the two papers that have been presented. Dr. Farid. Um, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed reading uh, both the papers. Um, I thought they were excellent interventions in the sense that this is a regional conversation, uh, which is refreshing from some of the more functional comparative constitutional projects that you see elsewhere, um, where post-colonial countries are usually the subject of, of this kind of external ga gaze from the glo uh, global north, and also uh, considered deviations from sort of Western notions of, of, of legal institutions. So all that said, you know, South Asia is a very interesting um, place for all of these legal and constitutional developments. Um, Bangladesh, you know, with its 50 years of experience, I think we're at a critical juncture to kind of assess and evaluate um, what's also going on in, in the region and Bangladesh's place within all of these regional uh, developments. Uh, so with that said, um, I was struck by um, some of the things in, in both the papers. So I'll start with the first paper. Um, I, I was struck by what you mentioned in the paper as controls. Um, and I think if you mention controls, um, maybe actual empirical data might be helpful keeping with your focus on structural design. Um, it would probably help to look at um, certain events or certain incidents or certain uh, developments that occurred because of certain structural designs and how they differed in Bangladesh versus Sri Lanka. So if you look at the development and expansion of parliamentary power in Bangladesh, uh, it has been complex. Uh, Bangladesh has experimented with both parliamentary and presidential systems. So that's that on its own, um, I think is, is a big similarity. And I think you shouldn't be afraid of highlighting that in the paper, um, just sort of off right, right at the beginning. Um, also, you know, it has been ruled under, under more than one military dictatorship, um, but with each passing regime, of course, what we see is that the centralized nature of the state has been reconsolidated. Um, and also the centralizing and the consolidating tendencies in the state stem from this bureaucracy centered colonial uh, sort of structure that we inherited and also the kind of contemporary politicization of structures of governance. So the comparison which the authors have engaged in, um, in, in, in this sort of the case studies that they've engaged in is what Harshan Kumara Singham has termed as Eastminster. So I do hope that you look at his work uh, for the origins of what we call Westminster style parliament, right? So Eastminster, which is basically the, the mm -hmm. British legacy of, of parliamentary institutions, um, not just here in South Asia, but also elsewhere. So if you look at kind of Asian uh, legal elites um, at the point of decolonization, so even when they were engaging in criticism under colonial rule, were thoroughly acculturated in British political norms. And this was reflected in their political regime choices, despite some of the demographic disparities and, and the prevalent cleavages. So British accounts of the Westminster model um, uniformly relegate the sovereign or their representatives to a solely uh, ceremonial role. In contrast, in Eastminster heads of state in, in sort of British Asia, if we can call it that, um, some of these legal elites profess that, that these systems were modeled on the British royal template, but you also see these elites engaging in polit political activism, and many saw themselves as having personal prerogatives, which then encouraged them to intervene in politics, right? So you have examples of sacking and selecting prime ministers, ministers, commanding the military, uh, formulating policies, chairing major committees, directing the cabinet and the civil service, um, and completely ignoring the legislature at times. Um, so these are generally unheard of in Britain or let's say the settler states, uh, Australia, for instance. So the principles of responsible government uh, also in some instances were overturned. Um, additionally, historically, the two party system was seen as critical to the practice of Westminster government. Uh, Eastminster, like much of the Commonwealth, 
um, did not exhibit conditions that make a two-party system operable. So, and this situation was, of course, not helped by the traditional uh, majoritarian first-past-the-post method, and more often than not, uh, one-party dominated politics, uh, whether that's in sort of contemporary South Asia, or if you look back at the Muslim League or the Indian National Congress or coalitions of elites such as the Ceylon's uh, UNP, uh, which was created with the purpose of receiving power from colonial rule, right? So all of this in many instances have rendered opposition a very lonely and a heroic occupation, right? Secondly, the Eastminster uh, provided very few incentives. And this is, I think, very relevant for Sri Lanka as well, that there were very few incentives of the system to the kind of the balance between center and majority to protect and accommodate minorities, right? So in Sri Lanka, for instance, the linguistic rights of a major minority were removed by a parliament dominated by parties seeking the majority community support and went through requiring just a show of hands and without breaching the constitution. So throughout Asia, right, the political realities dictated that minority rights were ultimately secondary to majority ambitions and realities. And politically, the majoritarian mechanics embedded into the Westminster suited the Eastminster leaders who invariably came from the dominant group in their society. Minority rights, um, whatever their legal status, owed their success or failure to the precarious realm of the political exigencies of the center, which often functioned without credible minority representation. And also, if you look at the evolution of this system, the government of India was almost uncritically accepted, um, particularly as it made its way from India, Pakistan to Bangladesh. And the most controversial elements appropriated were the emergency provisions, um, which a lot of the anti-colonial nationalists had with good reason spent much time and ink uh, decrying <laughs> to the colonial power. So those same leaders were then quick to accept and adopt the same powers. And in the chaotic times that followed independence, you know, there were creative use of conventions so intrinsic to British constitutional life, which proved valuable to Asia's governing elites as a means of stifling opposition. Um, so if you take the Pakistan 1954 fiasco of dissolution of the legislature, that's a case in point, uh, which actually followed 17th century English precedents. So anyway, all of this to say that, um, you know, perhaps looking at some of the, the ways in which it evolved in this part of the world might actually enrich uh, some of the discussions that the first paper um, is, is uh, looking at. The second paper, uh, which again, I thought the comparisons were very useful. I don't think a comparison of this sort has been done in the past. Um, that said, I would encourage the author to focus on, on some of the aspects and I'll go through some of the headings um, or at least in terms of the three factors which, uh, which he identifies. So one of them is the kind of socioeconomic changes in the middle class and its nexus. Uh, with, with the judiciary and how that impacts judicial independence. Um, I think what is being presented here is a case of judicial populism. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to look at um, Yasser Qureshi's work on judicial populism. Uh, popularity with the middle class here, um, you know, coincided with a, a PIL moment, particularly in Bangladesh. And, you know, this was a, a case that was similar in India in the post Indira Gandhi moment, um, and also in the South Asian incarnation of PIL, in which we see significant judicial activism, is in many ways distinguishable from the Anglo American experience, right? So in South Asia, you have the judiciary taking on issues of socioeconomic justice, state repression, and governmental lawlessness. But if you take the United States, for instance, uh, the public interest litigation discourse, and the kind of judicial power is grounded in notions of civic participation in governmental decision making to secure greater fidelity to parlous notions of legal liberalism and interest group pluralism. Uh, so for this section, I think the media discussion that you engage in can be truncated somewhat because the media and the judiciary have not always had an amicable relationship. I mean, we can cite Tons of examples uh, where the media and judiciary were actually in loggerheads as opposed to in a, in a, in a relationship of cooperation, uh, which then takes us to the second issue, which is the emergence of divisions between elites. Um, and here I was a little bit surprised to not see uh, an extended discussion on judicial appointments, which I think is an important factor. And, and also I think is at the center of, of elite friction and conflicts. 
Um, and thirdly, the emergence of a strategic and populist leader. Um, I would encourage you to perhaps um, not make the sweeping claim about uh, the absence of a strategic and populist leader. Um, and I would encourage you to look at the background to the Eighth Amendment case in Bangladesh, uh, which established the basic structure doctrine. So this case uh, presaged popular mobilization, resulting in the ousting of a military dictator. And each one of those judges who re ruled in those cases went on to be chief justices, and they were excellent leaders. But you have to bear in mind that um, sort of a golden period was this kind of transition, like the, the next decade after democratic transition. Um, particularly within the judiciary. Um, but you have to bear in mind that this is also a period in that decade, uh, which was preoccupied with the caretaker government and transition to power. And the judiciary was in fact providing an in integrity functions for elections, right? Making sure that elections were free and fair. Um, I would also encourage you to uh, perhaps look at the historical background. I know there was a claim in the paper also in your presentation that legal history and culture uh, tend to be irrelevant, um, but I think uh, there is a great deal of relevance of the path dependencies and colonial continuities that plague South Asian systems across the region. Uh, you know, there are good reasons why separation of powers, particularly separating the judiciary from the executive was included in South Asian constitutions but largely as aspirations and not in the main chapters of the constitution, right? So separation of judiciary and executive uh, were sort of aspirational goals that were to be achieved uh, sometime in the future. And separation of judiciary of, from the executive is not a new problem. It has been a protracted problem in the region since the late 18th century. You can go all the way back to the Regulating Act of 1773 and the creation of this nascent kind of state apparatus and courts. Uh, also, if you look at kind of early 20th century political claims, both the Indian National Congress, the Muslim League, and kind of other offshoot parties that, that ultimately contributed to uh, the partition and so on and so forth, um, all of these resolutions, uh, they, they included demands for separation of powers and judicial independence and courts were operating under intense uh, authoritarian conditions then too, but you know there were ways of not just political activism, but also activism from the bar and the courts plugged in judicial independence in a way um, that that kind of, there was de facto judicial independence, even if there wasn't de jure judicial independence. Uh, one last point, uh, which is uh, checks and balances uh, downstream within institutions, kind of vertical checks and balances. Bangladesh does not have a prosecution service, but Pakistan adopted one, if I'm not mistaken, sometime in 2005. And, and I think these controls within institutions are just as important for judicial independence. And I would really encourage you to perhaps look um, not just within the judiciary, but also in the kind of ancillary um, in support institutions that enhance judicial independence. I'm going to end there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fareed. Uh, I would, uh, maybe the presenters can come back to respond to some of the queries that she has given and maybe could answer some of her uh, feedback as well. Now, I'd kindly request uh, Mr. Mustafa Zeroman Khan to give his feedback on the papers presented. Thank you very much, Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, unlike most of the, uh, uh, certainly unlike the presenters as well as the other panelists, my own academic credentials are much more modest. I am essentially a practicing lawyer Nonetheless, uh, the reason perhaps why I have been invited by Dr. Siddiqui to uh, have a few words here in this uh, particular seminar is because recently we had an opportunity to work together in the context of a particular case. And uh, during that time, we had some opportunity for exchanging some idle views. And in that context, perhaps Dr. Siddiqui was uh, interested in some of the uh, views that I had expressed. And I will take this opportunity to expound upon those views. Some of it will also echo on what has been presented by the two present by the, in the two papers, as well as some of the comments that Dr. Sindhya Farid has also made. Now, uh, I was very interested in Dr. Norman Riyak's uh, presentation, and particularly the factors that he has identified, which uh, uh, affects the independence of judiciary in a country like Bangladesh. 
Now, one of the areas which I believe is very, inter, uh, very important uh, when you consider the independence of the judiciary is the role of the bar. And this is something which Dr. Farid had hinted upon when she uh, mentioned the Eighth Amendment case. The Eighth Amendment case uh, for those, uh, for, certainly for the uh, younger participants in this uh, particular forum is perhaps the uh, zenith as far as the Supreme Court of Bangladesh is concerned insofar as its role in protecting uh, the uh, rule of law in Bangladesh, the uh, democracy in Bangladesh, as well as the basic structure uh, of the constitution of Bangladesh. And that zenith was attained uh, because of a partnership between the bar and the judiciary. The Eighth Amendment case, I believe it was in 1988, the uh, context of the Eighth Amendment case very simply was this. By the Eighth Amendment of the constitution, which was uh, precipitated by uh, General Ashad's government, uh, the uh, Supreme Court was bifurcated into six or seven or eight benches throughout the country. And this was challenged in the Supreme Court as offending the basic structure of our constitution, which is a unitary constitution. And in, before this particular uh, case was brought to the court, it was preceded by two or three years of movement from the end of the bar, uh, from the side of the bar, during which the members of the executive committee of the Supreme Court of Bar Association had to even undergo imprisonment. Uh, there was a period for a couple of years when the Supreme Court Bar Association actually boycotted the court. And what happened at that time was uh, uh, the lawyers used to prepare the briefs, send them over to the court. The briefs were presented by the clients themselves. Uh, that was just a mere formality. What the judges did were they actually looked into the brief they, uh, and made their determinations accordingly. I think this is a very significant uh, episode in our legal history, uh, which has not been researched, which has not been commented upon uh, in the halls of academia, but this collaboration that actually took place between the judiciary and the bar in the period between 85, 86, 87, 88. I myself was not a lawyer then, I am not that old, but nonetheless, this is something which has been relayed to me by my seniors during the course of, again, cups of tea in the Bar Association. But this collaboration was very significant, and I hope that this is something that the academia will look into. That, as I said, that was the zenith of, uh, 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 of the Bar in protecting the independence of judiciary in Bangladesh. We saw a faint echo of that in 1994. Uh, the subject of judicial appointments have also been touched upon in the course of the discussions that preceded my own meager contributions to this forum. But in 1994, what happened was that uh, the Chief Justice was not consulted by the then BNP government while making some judicial appointments. Uh, there is no constitutional requirement for this, but there is, was, there is a convention to the effect that the Chief Justice will be consulted when judicial appointments are made. Now, this convention was uh, ignored by the then ruling BNP government in uh, making some judicial appointments, even gazette notifications were published. But the Chief Jeff Justice refused to administer the oath. Uh, the, oath. the Chief Justice at that time was Shahbuddin Ahmed, uh, who was later president. And before that, during 1990, he was the acting president after the fall of the Ashad regime. So he said that, uh, very famously said that, I have been reduced to Mr. Nobody. I have not been consulted in the making of these judicial appointments. What is very interesting is that the government of the day, the BNP government actually backed down. And the reason why the BNP government backed down from that situation was the very robust leadership uh, that was provided by the bar at that particular time. The late Sayyid Ishtiaq Ahmed comes to mind. Uh, he, along with other such as senior lawyers, including Dr. Kamal Hussain, Barrister Moinul Hussain, I believe, they all went to the president and then went to the prime minister of the day. The then law minister, Mr. Murza Golam Hafiz, also had a very constructive role in ensuring that that particular episode had a happy ending in the sense that the Chief Justice was finally consulted. Two or three of the names which were put forward for appointment to the High Court were actually withdrawn. Now, what happened in 1980 and 1994 is in contrast to what has happened in more recently in 2017, when we saw the rather ignominious exit of Chief Justice Surendra Kumar Sunha. When uh, uh, this is something which Dr. Noman has touched upon in his paper, what was uh, not apparent when uh, Sinha, 
just, Justice, Chief Justice Sinha was subjected to this ignominious exit in September 2017, was there was no uh, 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 massive protest from the bar. Even though the bar at that time was led by a, the office bearers, the elected executive committee of the bar at the time were more sympathetic to the opposition or the de facto opposition BNP government because BNP is no longer in the parliament as well. And that was very disappointing to see, for me to see as a member of the bar. I often say, and this is, I'm saying this in the context of academia, uh, the greatest tragedy that happened in the political history of Bangladesh in the past 50 years was uh, the 15th of August, 1975, when the father of the nation, Bangabundu, was assassinated. But I think the second biggest tragedy in Bangladesh happened the, when, during the circumstances of Justice Sinha's exit. Uh, that uh, and uh, it, it is something which happened without any bloodshed, but nonetheless, on that particular day, a pillar of our constitution was actually assassinated, and uh, that passed without any serious comment. Uh, the weakness of the judiciary in that particular episode is also remarkable because basically, what happened, the other four senior members of the Supreme Court of the uh, appellate division of the Supreme Court, they were called into a meeting, or at least three of the four. One of them was traveling abroad. Three of them were called in by the Honorable President, who handed over a dossier uh, listing certain alleged irregularities against Justice Sinha. Constitutionally speaking, what they should have done, the next four judges or the next three judges, is that they should have told the President that we are not going to look at it. The Constitution provides for a mechanism of uh, referring uh, allegations about misconduct against a particular judge, in this instance, the Chief Justice himself. Please refer it to the Supreme Judicial Council. We will look at it at then in that context. Instead of uh, responding in that particular manner, which I believe would have upheld our constitution, they actually went back to Sinha, Chief Justice Sinha, and said that we will not sit with you. Uh, uh, and uh, this is very ironic because the uh, apex judiciary itself uh, 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 failed to rise to the occasion in order to uh, protect judicial independence. Now, this is a very recent episode in our political history. I'm only discussing it freely in the context of an academic discussion. This is still a very raw nerve because Sina is the immediate preceding Chief Justice. But nonetheless, I believe that this is something which has to be looked at by the academia. I am merely a lawyer. I can only give you anecdotes in that particular episode. But now uh, I would uh, like to touch upon something that Dr. Nauman has identified, that there are also socioeconomic factors which are at play. You're absolutely right. This is something, again, which requires a bit more empirical research. I think one of the reasons why the bar failed in 2017 to rise to the occasion is precisely the socioeconomic development of Bangladesh. As you have very rightly pointed out, despite everything, or perhaps because of everything, Bangladesh has made significant economic strides in the past 50 years. Bangladesh has graduated from the ranks of a lower income country to a lower middle income country. This means that the state has become much more richer. Since the state has become much more richer, there are now uh, uh, there are more opportunities for the state uh, uh, doling out patronage with which political loyalty is purchased. Uh, Dr. Farid mentioned about the necessity of having an independent prosecution service in Bangladesh and how that may impact upon the independence of judiciary. Well, my own academic credentials are rather limited, rather modest, but this is how I see it. In Bangladesh, uh, uh, because the government in power uses uh, various uh, 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 you know, opportunities of making appointments as a currency of patronage in order to buy political loyalty and also to reward political loyalty. What has happened in Bangladesh is that because the state has become richer, there is now much more to dole out. For instance, uh, appointments in, uh, 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 as lawyers of different uh, state-owned corporations, uh, appointments in the attorney general's office, appointments in the public prosecutor's office, uh, appointments in the government leader's office in the subordinate judiciary in district courts. Now, the prospect of such patronage is something, in my, in my view, prevents the, you know, the coercing of uh, 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 the bar in order to, you know, take a you know, united stance when it comes to uh, uh, being uh, more uh, robust uh, uh, in uh, defending the independence of the judiciary. Uh, this is something which has uh, uh, changed in the past 30 years. And this is a surprising or, or rather an unwitting effect of the economic development of Bangladesh. It is perhaps, again, an area which is uh, worth uh, you know, having uh, academic inquiry. 
Of course, Bangladesh, unlike Pakistan, has not been able to set up separate laws for uh, judicial appointments. Judicial appointments happen. Uh, 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 there is no transparency in the way in which judicial appointments happen in Bangladesh. Uh, judges are appointed by the president upon the advice of the honorable uh, prime minister. I uh, noted that Dr. Naumat Riyadh mentioned that the president, or rather not Dr. Naumat Riyadh, rather the first president, Mr. Peter Reed, mentioned that in Bangladesh, the chief justice is actually appointed by the president. Well, that is what is there in the paper. Practically speaking, even the chief justice is appointed on, upon the advice of the honorable prime minister. The most recent appointee as chief justice, uh, uh, the current chief justice, Mr. S uh, Sayyid Mahmoud Hussain, himself is a beneficiary of a superstition. The, according to the confession, uh, according to the convention, the after Sinha departed, the next senior most chief justice, uh, the next most senior judge, Mr. Justice Wahab Mia was supposed to become the Chief Justice. Now, I have it on good anecdotal authority. I cannot show it on paper that the President himself wanted to appoint Mr. Justice Wahab Mia as the next Chief Justice. Mr. Khan, let's not get specific. Oh, no, get, I will get specific. Uh, no no, no specific, no, 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 please. Dr. No. Siddiqui, I will get specific. I, I, I apologize for that. But I will I will get specific. Let's not get into the process. This is, this, is, this is an academic discussion. I think we should not be unafraid to talk about sensitive matters, taking names as well. This sort of self-censorship is something which makes us, which rather ex exacerbates the problem. Anyway, so uh, so so I think that uh, 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 that is also something which is worth inquiry. That is something which has to be looked at by the academia. The other two factors before I leave, or rather three factors, which I would like to touch upon, which affects the independence of judiciary in Bangladesh is that there is a certain opacity in the way in which the judiciary works in Bangladesh. The, uh, at the risk of sounding a bit patrician, the socio-cultural background of judges have changed over the, set of the past years. I think that is something which is also worth, acad uh, worth academic inquiry in the tradition of critical legal studies, uh, Scandinavian realism, American realism, which you see in countries abroad. We do not see a parallel to that in Bangladesh. It's high time that this should be there. One of the issues which, uh, as a practicing lawyer, I see, which affects my practice, uh, is this uh, uh, now uh, nowadays judges, some of the judges who are appointed are uh, have background from certain universities, and these alumni associations are very uh, uh, robust in 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 their activities, which is fine. We, there is no problem in it, but uh, so, sometimes the fraternization between judges and uh, members of the alumni association who are from the bar. Uh, introduces a layer of, how shall I put it, opacity in the way in which uh, uh, justice is administered in Bangladesh. Again, this is a subject matter which requires some empirical research. The reason I say this is not to stoke controversy or, or the other uh, aspects upon which I touched during my pre previous remarks is not to stoke controversy, rather to invite academia to look at upon, upon these different threads of investigation in order to apply uh, proper empirical research in order to, you know, uh, give us a better understanding of the legal system as it is working and also hint at uh, opportunities for reform. The last point that I would like to mention, and this is something that I picked up from Dr. Norma Triyat's uh, uh, paper, which was otherwise extremely illuminating and very interesting in terms of, you know, pointing uh, different directions of further inquiry. You remarked that both Bangladesh and Pakistan are federal republics. They are not. Bangladesh is a unitary republic, okay? And uh, the Bangladeshi unitary republic, the fact that Bangladesh is a unitary republic places its own challenge on our legal system, which also has an effect on the independence of judiciary. Now, in terms of population, Bangladesh is the largest unitary republic in the world. This is something which I have not seen commented upon by academia, but I believe this is something which places unique challenges and unique pressures on our judiciary. Again, I repeat, in terms of population, Bangladesh is the largest unitary republic in the world. And for that reason, our Supreme Court's workload, sheer workload of our Supreme Court is without parallel. The sheer workload of our judiciary is without parallel. For instance, forget about the Supreme Court. In the subordinate judiciary, in the magistrate's court, a typical magistrate in Dhaka has to dispose of 300 applications for bail during the course of a day. It is not possible, humanly possible, for a magistrate to give a judicially reasoned order while disposing an application for so many applications for bail. He basically has two minutes or three minutes to look at a bail application. 
Now, this is placing its unique pressures upon our judicial system, which is adversely impacting upon the quality of uh, justice, which is being delivered, and also the administration of justice. The other thing which has an impact upon this you know, unitary structure of our republic uh, uh, and the structural pressures on our legal system is again, precisely attributable to the development of Bangladesh. The modern state is a franchise state where different activities are licensed. Increasingly, the, you have to look at very complicated issues. So when it comes to judicial review applications, very often you will find that we are coming up with issues which are technical in nature, for instance, uh, regulation of a telecommunication company or regulation of a oil company. And these are issues which are very difficult for our judiciary to deal with in the summary jurisdiction of the re, re, summary writ jurisdiction. And very often the courts invariably have to bow down to uh, uh, you know wh whatever is the view of the executive. It, it's, it's because they are not, the circumstances are such that they are not adequately resourced to look into these issues. Uh, so this is something which again has to be uh, something which I believe is a matter of uh, academic scrutiny, uh, uh, the uh, unitary character of our Republic, how it is uh, putting a pressure upon our legal system. The last and last, uh, and, and this is the elephant in the room, the lack of democracy in Bangladesh. This has, uh, uh, we all know what happened in the elections of 2009, 2014, 2018. Dr. Siddiqui should rest relieved. I'm not going to expound on that now. But nonetheless, nonetheless, this lack of democracy is creating its own problem in Bangladesh. Basically, what has happened in Bangladesh is that the Government in power is there because of a combine between the bureaucracy and the military in Bangladesh. And the bureaucratic military elite in Bangladesh increasingly functions beyond the pale of judicial and, uh, admin and political accountability. Parliament is incapable of holding them to account. Uh, the courts are also incapable of holding them to account. And unless we restore a functional democracy in Bangladesh, uh, I think the future is bleak. And it's very ironic because at the same time, economically, Bangladesh is developing. Dr. Norma Triyat has commented that the Aumili government was elected. I'm not uh, uh, mentioning about the elections themselves, but the fact is that even if there were to be free and fair elections in Bangladesh, my own personal opinion is that the Aumili would still get a slim majority at the very least because of the fact that economically, the country is developing, the middle class is acquiescent and happy. As long as they are uh, making material progress, they don't really matter. Uh, uh, what's happening to the constitutional institutions in Bangladesh. So they, they, there is this, uh, you know, tacit acceptance of the middle classes and the uh, uh, business elite of what's happening in Bangladesh. And that is contributing to the process. Just one last point. Uh, uh, you commented upon the way in which the 13th Amendment was made unconstitutional. If you look at the history of elections in Bangladesh, you will find that in every election that was held under the auspices of a caretaker government, the last government which is, was in power, the last political party which was in power lost the elections. By the same token, whenever a political government was in power in holding an election, invariably the political government in power won. So that actually points to the uh, uh, importance of the caretaker system that had developed in Bangladesh and how effective it was in protecting at least a functional democracy in Bangladesh. And the way in which that system was gotten rid of by uh, Khairul Haq Chief Justice's court. And remember, Khairul Haq himself was appointed as Chief Justice out of turn, meaning that by convention, he would not have been Chief Justice. He was made Chief Justice by superseding somebody who was senior to him. And in the ordinary course, he would have retired before becoming a Chief Justice. So the fact that his appointment as Chief Justice done by a president who was uh, de facto acting on the advice of a prime minister, this is also something which may be looked at in the context of academic research. So thank you very much. So that's my contribution. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mustafa Zuraman Khan for your uh, feedback and comments on both the papers. Uh, I, I personally thought the floor is now open to questions. I will request uh, the, the, the uh, audience to text or uh, write the questions directly to me and I can ask the questions to the presenters. Uh, I thought both the papers were extremely interesting and they were looking at two very important institutions, uh, which plays a very integral part in upholding the constitution of any country. 
And uh, I, I wanted to ask a question to Peter and Gayantika both. And the fact that you have compared the uh, parliamentary system of both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Uh, my question to you is, do you think that the power uh, given to the president uh, in Sri Lanka has been curtailed uh, by the, after 2015? And do you think that actually helped uh, constitutional matters in Sri Lanka or parliamentary democracy for that matter? Um, so uh, I am, I think that there's, there's, there's a, a well, well, first of all, I, I'd, I'd like to say th 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 thank you very much to, to both the, both the discussants for, for fantastic um, comments on the, on, on, on the paper there. That's, that's, that'll be really useful for, for, for taking this forward, I think. Um, I, I, and then, and then this, this, this question about um, whether the, the powers of the president were, were really curtailed at all, I, I think it, it, it ties in a little bit also to um to the, to this 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 discussion of him um, exactly what, what sort of um role the the president president ought to have um i i suppose that um the the um the the key change from um from the um the balance of of, of executive power that um that, that was introduced during dur dur during that process was the what was the um the parliamentary con control over over cabinet and it's um and it's in its composition and and um, and and survival um and the, 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 the these changes of course were 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 done away with um, immediately after the immediately after the the most recent round of elections um, in the form of the the twentieth amendment um so so in a sense um the I, I I think that they they weren't really given a chance um to to um to to be to be properly to be properly sort of sort of experienced. Um, and and to, and to understand what what um, what changes just that nineteenth amendment could have made to the system in the long run, um, and, and then uh, we we didn't really go into this very 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 much in the paper, but um, but there, of course there, there's been there's been lots and lots of discussion in Sri Lanka about happened about what happened um, after after twenty fifteen and then then in the in the constitutional crisis that followed. Um, and and then I I think the the consensus is that uh, this was this was um this was about the 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 personality um the personalities involved rather than uh, rather than the structures that were introduced um and, and and you know essentially no matter no matter what the what the structures were um it probably wouldn't wouldn't have gone any other way because that's that 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 was the um, that that was just the the personal political dynamics at the time, which um, which determined which determined the outcomes essentially. Um, but but then but 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 even then, of course, I mean there 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 were there were in there 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 were interesting um, um, moments in that constitutional crisis, which showed which showed quite a lot of a lot of institutional strength, which which, which can be overlooked sometimes, I think. Um, both, both in terms of um, the, the the Supreme Court um, standing up against um, against um, an, an illegal um, dissolution of Parliament, um, and also the the um, MPs and Speaker um, himself um, who who stood up against against attempts to to um, manufacture manufacture a parliamentary majority. Um, and, and also through through um, pro prorogation procedures, which which we touch on slightly in this in this paper, but but which are an, an interesting sort of um, a remnant of a lot of these these Westminster and um, Westminster model independence constitutions, which um, which often haven't been haven't been gotten rid of, even though you know this. I think it's difficult to to justify them in in, in the in, in the modern age. Um, so 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 yeah, and and in, in, in short, um, I I think that probably the 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 nineteenth amendment just wasn't given a, a long enough run, um, to see actually what what changes, in political culture that 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 amendment itself could have introduced, 
um, and, and whether in, in the long run it would have significantly changed the role of the president um, or the position of the president. Right. And it's interesting, the fact that you've also uh, talked about the role of the technocratic ministers and you compared that uh, with Bangladesh, right? I mean, why do you actually think that technocratic ministers would actually be helpful? Because these are unelected people and uh, they, they obviously bring uh, onto the table various expertise, no doubt about that. But why do you think that experience from Bangladesh is actually going to help Sri Lanka? Um, so, so, yeah, it was, it was something that, that sort of... Um, Sort of caught her attention, um, because, um, bec- because there, there, there had been, um, or, or from, from, from my, 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 my perspective, you know, the sort of, um, the, the UK constitution, I, I'd, I'd examined, I examined this, um, before a few, a few years back, um, when, when, um, our, the, the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, um, also, also tried to, um, introduce something similar to this, um, through, um, through appointments to the House of Lords that were then brought into the cabinet, so 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 on on their on their on their technical expertise, um, so so you know the the, the the sort of you know the personal interest was sort of peak peak from, peak from that, and then um, I I think that um, in the context in the context of Sri Lanka, um, this this could be um, one of those one of those useful things, um, which which can which can balance some of the concerns. That um, that people can rightly have about a, about a, a change to parliamentarism, um, where where the where the um, where the um, the head of government is naturally subjected to to just a a, a much more limited pool um, of, of of expertise compared to um, compared to to what you have in a presidential system, at least in theory, um, I, I, and and then of course in, in a context where. Where there can be a lot of distrust in politicians as well, of course, um, and, um, and 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 wanting to to bring in the sort of the sort of game changers from 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 outside as as as, as were. I, I mean, I I I myself I am totally convinced um, that this is that this is some sort of um, great change in practice. Um, and you know this is some sort of country of religion which, which can which, which can really enliven you know a, a, a cabinet. I, I'm not convinced of that, but 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 I think I think it could be I think it could be at least a useful, at very least could be something useful to to take care of um, of of very legitimate concerns. Uh, and and also, um, it's, it's as long as it has some some proper restrictions. It, it it probably shouldn't do 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 at least any harm either, and 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 some new expertise could 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 possibly be brought in that wouldn't be there otherwise. Right. Good. Th- th- thanks for those clarifications. Now, uh, going to Mr. Dr. Ria, uh, if you would like, you can respond to some of the feedback that you got from our discussions, and I also like you to answer uh, or uh, want to know your opinion uh, about the fact of the concept of separation of power. Right. I mean. Uh, in your paper, you discuss a lot about the Supreme Court of God, Bangladesh and Pakistan uh, getting into the realm of policy making. Now, uh, you know, you have three independent organs of the state and obviously the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and to Pakistan to some extent have the right to fend off anything that comes within their turf. But when do Supreme Courts in both these countries, should they be... Uh, making policy decisions, legislating, when actually that's the domain of the parliament, right? So please uh, uh, respond to some of the comments of that and if you may kindly answer that question as well. Dr. Riyad. I think let's, let's, uh, let me start with this, uh, your question, and then I will go back to uh, separation of powers. So the fundamental, the basic understanding is judiciary has to interpret, legislature has to legislate, make law, and ex- executive has to execute the law. Now, if this is fine, I mean, this is something uh, I'm quite okay with that. But in the field, when I interview judges, uh, and more or less, it was the responses of the Polish and the Egyptian and the Pakistani judges quite similar. And this, you know, and, 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 and this is the conflict, the understanding, and that's the question itself, which needs to needs further exploration at how different elites understand this definition and then the society. When you ask, you know, civil society organization representatives or litigants, how do you see judicial independence? And they say, 
various judicial independence, fundamental rights are not protected, and this so on and so forth. But when you ask judges, they say, okay, fine, if, if the protection of the fundamental rights is our domain, then what about the parliament and what about the executive? And you know, what about this understanding that we only are supposed to interpret the law? And this is where you know, many judges in the UK and you know, especially in the immigration cases or the terrorism related cases, uh, uh, they, they say the same thing. You know, we have to interpret the law. You put law before us and we are, are supposed to interpret the law. You're not supposed to protect or think about other things. Now, as I said in my presentation, in our authoritarian and hybrid regimes, where there's a lot of de facto things going on. So military effects, you know, influences things there in Egypt, Pakistan, and on, on different location in Bangladesh as well. But is it documented? Is it like, can we record, can we prove that it is it's happening there? It always happens from behind the scenes. So in this context, this, you know, theoretical understanding of separation of powers almost becomes, you know, irrelevant. And, and you know, the lines between different institutions that are, uh, that, 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 that seems to be blurry. So you cannot, you know, rigidly separate. Another thing, another response, you know, I would, uh, I would, I would like to respond that when we, when we talk about law, we need to understand that law is a product, you know, you expect the judiciary to interpret the law, but the essence of the law itself is political. So it's the intertwining nature, you know, it, 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 is, it emerges as a result of a political process, debates and the political concentrations. And ultimately when it, it reaches the law, where the judges have to see the framers intentions and different other things, depending upon those approaches, they have to interpret the law lines you know inherently become blurry so it, it, it becomes difficult to say like judiciary has to do this thing and you know this is the only job and you know parliament has to make the law uh, and also if you ask you know if you go to the judgments they do justify this thing you know consistently from through or from the beginning till end that we are making we are not making the law and we are only interpreting the law even though they are actually making the law, they do involve in the policy making, but they do justify that they are not. Making the law. Now, uh, coming to the responses, uh, briefly, you know, quickly, I will respond. Uh, first, the federal state, and I think that's that's very important to respond to the federal state uh, thing. Uh, I agree with you. I need to I need to bit explain you know explain more what do I mean by a federal state. I think you are you are quite. I, I agree with you. Uh, no different thought on that. That theoretically new. Bangladesh is the unitary state, and uh, Pakistan is the federal state, and same goes for the for the U.S., Canada, and you know other Germany, uh, other federal state. But recently, you know the new developments. Recent, uh, there's a growing literature which suggests that when it comes to judici uh, the judiciary and the role of the judiciary in different areas of policy making, politics, this difference between the federal states and the unitary state is becoming slightly irrelevant. For example. You know, after Devolution Act in 2003 in the UK, where you know, in this country, uh, we the devolution, the powers distributed among different tiers of the judiciary and the Supreme Court, and how you know different Scotland, Ireland, and you know England and Wales, the uh, the distribution of powers among them, it presents and you know there are a lot of studies there uh, which suggest that. It's a quasi-federal, or should we say that it's a theoretically uh, unitary, but practically it's a federal state. Because if you go from one unit to another, different laws, different legal system, uh, not entirely, but you know, to a large extent. But I do agree with you. I need to, you know, add this, you know, explain this thing that uh, what do I mean when I say, you know, federal state? Because it sounds like it's unitary. Um, I'm saying, you know, it's also theoretically Bangladesh is federal and Pakistan both. Or federal. Now, the second uh, you mentioned, um, Mustafi's mentioned uh, about the 1994 case, and it's quite uh, quite similar to uh, what we say judges case in context of India and judge in, in Pakistan. So the uh, Jihad Al Jihad Trust case in Pakistan and Asadari case in uh, Pakistan, and same the uh, case of Anandan case in India. It's quite similar, you know, when it uh, comes to, but but the uh, social political context is different, and it's quite uh, illuminating, which you know, the uh, 
empirical evidence which you shared with me. Uh, and the rest of uh, the responses, comments, he, yeah, I mean, I think that more or less I agree with you and I need to take into, take all these things into account. Um, yeah, and in the end, I will say, I, I mean, I'm very grateful to both of you. Uh, feedback was very rich. And I, in one word, it was, it was very illuminating, mind blowing for me, especially the Mustafi's, uh, it was quite uh, overwhelming, but fully, you know, very enriching. Thank you. Right. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on one of the comments that uh, that was made by Barrister Mustafiz as well, and this question to Dr. Uh, Brat as well. Uh, maybe in your paper, as uh, Barrister Mustafiz has pointed out, uh, the role of the bar is, is 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 pretty important as well. And also, when you are um, talking about social mobility in your paper, I think social mobility is very important in regard to the new lawyers coming to the bar and also uh, the, the judges who are selected from the same bar, uh, because the notion of being a lawyer has changed a lot. I don't, I don't know about Pakistan, but it has changed a lot in Bangladesh. A young lawyer now coming to Bangladesh or being enrolled to the bar is more interested to make money uh, and to present their case. I mean, nowadays, for example, you do not actually see young lawyers having a senior. Right, you see, a uh, more, uh, more uh, young lawyers uh, wants to get quick cases, wants to make quick bucks, and 15 years down the line, or 25 years, or 20 years down the line, when the same person becomes, uh, or is in a position when he becomes a judge, his way of thinking it's more transactional. You see, and that is why I think that is something. Uh, uh, which you need to take into consideration. And it might be similar in Pakistan as well. And uh, maybe that is something uh, which, which could also enrich your paper, right? So uh, uh, the social mobility is not only for people in general, obviously people in general have their own understanding of what law is and what we should be doing. But I think the bar and the bench, uh, the, 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 especially in terms of quality, in terms of principle, uh, that is something which, which should also be taken into account, right? Uh, I do not have any other questions from anybody. Uh, oh, I have a question, actually. Uh, uh, actually, a question for the discussants, all right, uh, to Dr. Cynthia Farid. On the reflection on diversity in the judiciary and comparative perspective, and also on the constitutional scholarship in South Asia, and the scope for developing this further and prospects for exchange? Uh, Barrister Sarah Hussain has asked this question. So what is your uh, comment on that? Or what is your take on that? Can you please diversity. repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so basically your comment is diversity in the judiciary and yeah. comparative perspectives, and also on the constitutional scholarship in South Asia and the scope for developing this further and pros prospects for exchange. It's a, that's a tall order for me it's to It's pretty broad, yeah. But in in, in five seconds, um, I think I'll, in terms of diversity, I mean, I think judicial appointments and the way it's done, um, also I think the state of legal education, it's, it's basically whatever you're producing from the law schools, it's, is what's going into the profession, right? Whether it's the bar or the judiciary. And I think diversity um, there, um, it, it, it's really dependent on what the law schools are producing. And I think if you look at the state of our law schools, both public and private, uh, not just us, but it, across South Asia, right? Because if you look at Indian law schools and the curriculums and the way, um, way kind of it connects to the profession, um, I think that um, we certainly have some way to go. Uh, and one of the things that I, I saw um, while I was doing some research in the Calcutta High Court, uh, for example, was the ways in which, uh, you know, pupils were, were paired up with judges. So you're kind of like preparing young people from a, from a very young age. And I think that also, uh, there is no sense of that in our judiciary. But in terms of constitutional law within the region and how it's uh, written about and scholarship within the region, I think um, it's expanding. For a long time, I think it was uh, somewhat legalistic, somewhat non-interdisciplinary, but I think that is changing. 
Um, for a long time now, um, I think over the past maybe five years compared to constitutional law, certainly within the region, and if you look at global South constitutionalism generally, I think there is this critique that it was largely um, functional and it was largely legalistic without really looking at uh, the, the on the ground developments of what's happening. Uh, so I think we probably need in terms of improving that, uh, we probably need um, more empirically grounded work. Uh, to be honest, like in the last sort of, I mean, I, I returned after a long hiatus uh, back to Bangladesh and I've actually just started going back to court. And in my last couple of weeks of intensely going to court every day, I, 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 I'm sort of thinking at this point, I have to unlearn so much because so much is happening that you don't read in the books. <laughs> like so much of it is, is what you're having to learn from, from just interactions. There are certain court conventions and none of this is captured in the current kind of scholarship. So I think it, it certainly needs to be more empir empirically grounded. And when I say empirically grounded, I don't mean necessarily quantitative studies, uh, which are great, but I think that sort of really looking at what's going on and kind of that needs to be reflected in constitutional scholarship, not just in Bangladesh, I think within the region in general. So I hope that that answers the question. Thank you. Right, I have a question for uh, Mr. Saros again for all the presenters and the discussants as well. And uh, their specific question is, we have constitutional commitments across the region on gender equality and non-discrimination based on caste, religion, race. And there are a new statutory duties re-eliminating discrimination against people with disabilities or on grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. How do you see these issues being addressed in representation of judiciary? One example is in Bangladesh, we are challenging Bangladesh judicial service rules, which bar people with disabilities from being recruited. Besar Khan, uh, do you want to comment on that? Or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, for, uh, for, uh, I think, uh, again, uh, my own contribution would be anecdotal. Uh, recently, there has been a judgment of our Supreme Court, which I found very interesting. Uh, there was this uh, lady who stood first in the Kazi enrollment examinations, marriage registrar enrollment examinations. She was not recruited. She came first. And uh, she challenged this action in the uh, Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Now, our High Court has given a judgment saying that there are certain cultural or religious functions that are supposed to be discharged by the marriage registrar, which a female marriage registrar may not always be in a position to discharge by going to a mosque. And for that reason, the, 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 the rule was uh, discharged, her challenge failed. Now, I'm not sure whether this will be escalated to the appellate division, but uh, uh, with all due respect to the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, and what was particularly remarkable was that one of the two judges of the bench which delivered that judgment was a woman. Now, uh, 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 the, 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 I think that uh, there is some way to go before uh, we see uh, gender issues being you know, properly addressed as far as our uh, uh, judiciary is concerned. And uh, on a slightly different note, I am very uh, grateful uh, to Dr. Siddiqui for raising another issue which is uh, uh, of concern to me personally. It is the uh, you know, approach of young lawyers these days. I mean, uh, during the 80s, 90s, we saw young lawyers coming forth who had a you know, commitment to you know, constitutional issues, issues pertaining to human rights and gender rights and so on and so forth. I think we, we lost Baisra Khan. There. Uh, and Peter, do you want to give your comment on that, please? On, on the question of gender equality and non discrimination based on caste in the judiciary in general, based upon your studies in South Asia, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka? Peter? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah you know, it's, um, it's, it seems to be um, another one of these issues which. Um, which um, which seem very very difficult to 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 investigate from 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 the outside, as it were, um, where, where the 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 um, the word 
the written word and practice seem to be seem to be very different. Um, and it's, it seems seems like the the um, the anecdote which which which, which we which, which just said there is um, is 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 a great example of that. Yeah. yeah. Right, and uh, Dr. Riyadh? I think the, uh, I mean, the, there are two aspects of this uh, uh, gender equality. And it relates to this debate of um, judicial diversity. And it's very, very popular debate here in, in the UK. And I, I think I still remember uh, related to this issue. I presented a paper about comparing Australia and the UK. And the, the question was about judicial diversity. Uh, I agree with you that the representation of different genders. And then, you know, th this also we need to take into account when we say gender, it's not like female or ma male. It's all about all gender groups. There are different other gender groups. Uh, you know, their representation on the bench and in the bar is quite, you know, it's, it's, it's far lower than what their population is. Um, uh, in case of Pakistan, it's quite visible. Uh, India, it's, it improved relatively compared to Pakistan or other South Asian states. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the reason, uh, what's the reason? The reason is I will, uh, one of the reasons is which uh, Mustafi has mentioned, the socioeconomic background. And also it is present in the Harsh's, Rand Harsh's thesis. You know, when the state, the dominant majority, the, the, the dominant majority groups uh, occupying the state positions, they share an interest. And they not only they make laws or they you know, interact uh, with each other in a way in which uh, ways and paths to the other ethnic minorities as well as gender minorities, it gets restricted. So they, 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 they're not going to give space to them because it's literally, uh, you know, uh, giving them with an opportunity to challenge the state authority. So uh, this is one of the one of the reasons. But the second reason, you know, if I am self-critical, I will say, if I'm, you know, critical of my own argument, I will say that we also need to think about that if this equation between gender and decision making isn't it against the theory of separation of power, which you mentioned? So for example, there's a tendency, and this is what I notice in debate on judicial diversity, that they keep on advocating there must be more representation of females or other BAME, you know, uh, LGBT groups in the, um, in, 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 on bench and in the bar. But do we mean to say that if a female is going to decide female issues, that will deliver, that will serve more justice than, uh, you know, if a male is going to decide. This equation between decision-making and gender seems to be a bit dangerous uh, in relation to the theory of separation of power. Because in that sense, we are, we are saying that actually powers are not separated. The separation of powers are actually dependent upon other factors which are non-legal, which are not, uh, you know, something based on laws. That's it. Thank you. Right. Th thank you, Dr. Riyadh. I think uh, we're nearly finished uh, over here. Uh, I basically want to thank all, both the pre uh, three presenters for presenting their paper. I also want to thank the discussants as well. I think the main uh, focus of this conference, and we're going to have another segment uh, this evening as well, and I want to invite all of you to attend that at 6 p.m. Bangladesh time on a very interesting topic as well, and tomorrow morning as well, 9.30 a.m. Bangladesh time. And I think the main purpose of holding this uh, conference was uh, to discuss very important critical issues. Uh, and since Bangladesh is celebrating uh, its 50 years, and we're actually going to celebrate the 50 years of our constitution next year, next November. Uh, and uh, being uh, one of the countries uh, born relatively late compared to the other South Asian countries, I think we have made a lot of progress, but still a lot more needs to be done. And there is a lot we can learn from other South Asian countries, not only South Asian countries, but other countries which were born or which got independence during the same time as well. And the purpose of this conference is to basically get young academics
to present their papers and also to get panelists and discussants who are both academics and also practicing lawyers or practicing in their profession so that we can get feedback from those two important segments uh, uh, of people who, who, who can bring in their perspectives and can give their feedback. So I thought uh, both the papers were relatively, uh, were extremely well, uh, well put up. And uh, the feedback that has been given by the panelists, I'm going to email both of you again uh, with the references that has been given by one of the panelists so that that will help you to uh, incorporate those observations in your paper. And I want to thank all uh, the people attending today's conference for taking the time to do so. We feel very encouraged by this. And uh, especially uh, the, the, the presenters, it's, it's five, you guys are five hours behind and 4 a.m. in the morning in the UK. And it takes a lot of commitment. And I'm really, really, really grateful to both of you. And also to uh, uh, Ms. Ranatunga. I mean, she's uh, 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 come to us from Benin. Uh, so so uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to all the people who attended this conference. And I also want to thank Blast, Sales, and also the University of Asia Pacific for helping us organize this. So uh, thanks again. And I want to invite you again to our next segment at 6 p.m. today. And I hope all of you have a very nice day. And uh, good morning again, or good afternoon to those in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed day.